what we're going to talk about is uh, nutrition and the effect on behavior, primarily brain function. And uh, this is a wide open field. We're learning a lot of things about nutrition that before were only guessed at. And one of the really exciting things is the effect of nutrition on genetics. We're finding that nutrition can control whether genes are operative or non-operative. In other words, they're on or off. And we're finding that you can, uh, early in the stages of development, alter a child's and the mother's nutrition and you can affect a uh, child's life from then on, either negatively or positively. Uh, reducing uh, breast cancer risk is something that's found recently. Reducing hypertension as an adult by what you do and feed your child as, as uh, even in utero. But we're going to concentrate here on the effect of nutrition on brain function and particularly people's behavior. Now, we know that uh, the brain uses a tremendous amount of energy. The brain is the only part of the body whose metabolism uh, and function never completely rest. The brain's metabolism never slows down significantly. If you give massive dose of phenobarbital and put people in an extremely deep coma where you have to control their respiration, you can only reduce the brain's metabolism 50% doing that. So people that are in deep, deep comas still have pretty high metabolism inside of their brain. And because the brain is metabolizing these nutrients so rapidly, you produce a lot of free radicals and lipid peroxidation products. That means you start oxidizing the different parts of the brain, which is harmful. And now we're beginning to realize that almost all neurological conditions somehow come back to that. Whether it's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, all these diseases are characterized by high free radical generation, high process of lipid peroxidation, which begins to destroy the structure of the brain, its connections, the cells, uh, alters the mitochondria and the DNA. And the effect of that is that unless you replace those damaged parts, the brain function begins to fall off more and more. And we know that the effect on the brain is not uniform. Some parts of the brain are more sensitive than other parts. Uh, just to give you an example of how metabolically active the brain is, the brain consumes 20% of all the oxygen in the blood, 25% of all the glucose in the blood, and yet it's only 2% of the weight of the body. So it is an enormous metabolic factory going on in all of these cells inside of the brain. The other thing that's important to remember, just like all parts of your body, is the brain is constantly being replaced. Every component in the brain is replaced. Some take years, some take decades, but we're finding out that some of the most important cons uh, components, uh, primarily the omega-3 fatty acid like DHA, is replaced very, very rapidly within about two weeks. Uh, and what this means is if you're deficient in it, your brain begins to change its structure very quickly so that the brain cannot function because one of its vital components is missing and it only takes about two weeks of deficiency to produce that. Now, one of the first hints that there might be a connection between what you eat and your behavior was by uh, Dr. George Gould back in 1910. So we see this is not completely new. And then we see in 1935, it was found that hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, could mimic many of the serious neurological and psychological conditions, like anxiety, neurosis, hysteria, neurasthenia, and even psychosis could be imitated by people becoming hypoglycemic. And then in 1973, Dr. Wendell and Beebe found that there was a 74% incidence of hypoglycemia in people who had schizophrenia, the type of schizophrenia associated with anxiety. In other words, a very hyperactive schizophrenic. Almost three quarters of them, or three quarters of them, were uh, hypoglycemic. And we'll see what that does. And we're seeing a strong connection between sugar metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism in the brain, and various psychological conditions. For instance, they found 60% of the members of families that have hyperactive children either have diabetes, obesity, alcoholism, all three, which are all sugar consumption problems. So there's a very strong correlation there in hyperactivity in children. 
More research indicated that 75% of all prisoners were hyperactive as children. So it's taking it back all the way to this childhood that was programming that child for criminal behavior later in their life. Now, why would sugar have such a profound influence on brain function and psychological function? Well, when the sugar is in excess, it produces excess release of insulin. When insulin is released, you get hypoglycemia if it's excessive. That is, the blood sugar falls. When the blood sugar falls, it does two things. One, your body is trying to get that blood sugar back up because it needs that sugar for its energy metabolism. So it stimulates the adrenal gland to release two hormones. These are called epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the hormones that make you jittery and nervous when your blood sugar falls. So if these hormones are stimulating the brain to increase activity. Also, when the brain becomes hypoglycemic, it releases one of its neurotransmitters called glutamate. Glutamate is the primary neurotransmitter for excitability. So it is the primary thing that turns the brain's activity into high gear. So both of these, the norepinephrine, epinephrine, and glutamate are producing a state of hyperactivity. Now let's look at the effect of crime and nutrition. Uh, this was done by Dr. Stitt, who did, was a probation officer in uh, Ohio, who did some uh, research on the effect of uh, diet and uh, probation violators. And what she found is that those who remained on a bad diet, a lot of sugar, a lot of junk food, a lot of food additives like MSG, NutraSweet, these things, when they stayed on that, 56% of them ended up violating their probation uh, by committing some antisocial act, robbery, violence, etc. But if they were switched to a healthy diet, only 8% ever broke their probation. So there was a tremendous change in their behavior just by changing their diet. And these are, are felons. When they looked at narcotic abuse, they found the same thing is that those who maintain the bad diet, the high sugar diet, junk food diet, 47% of them continued to use narcotics while they were on probation. Whereas those who were switched to the better diet, only 13% of them violated their probation by using narcotics. So it's a rather profound effect, it's not a minor effect. They also coincidentally found there was a dramatic reduction in suicides. So there was a strong correlation between this high sugar, high junk food diet and suicidal behavior. Now the Alabama prison system also did the similar study. They changed the diet of some of the prisoners and used the others to control. They found that there was a 42% reduction in criminal events when they changed these criminals' diet. And that there was a 61% reduction in antisocial behavior at one year. Another example of the profound effect of diet. Now just to give you a personal case, this is Raymond. Uh, Raymond was arrested for uh, assaulting his girlfriend. He actually tried to kill her. Uh, they were just arguing over something that was non-consequential, uh, just, just silly. But he flew into a rage, pulled his 357 Magnum, grabbed her, put it up to her head to shoot her, and she knocked it out of the way with her hand and he shot through her hand. Uh, she wouldn't file charges against him, but the state charged him with firing a, a, a weapon inside the city limits, so they arrested him. Well, uh, Dr. Stitt went back and looked at his history, and what she found out is that age four, his mother said he had these weak spells when he was playing, and he gets so weak he couldn't hardly play any longer. She'd give him a little sugar, and then he would get back into his full activity and be fine until his blood sugar fell again, and it, it kept repeating. At age 13, she noticed there was radical mood swings and that his grades were beginning to fail, and he would have violent outbursts. This was coincident with his falling blood sugar. And at age 23, he attempts murder on his girlfriend. So she took him while he was on parole and put him on a special diet. His diet before consisted of junk foods, donuts, pastry, candy, and coffee, which is a lot of people's diet, particularly young people. And what they found is when they took him off all of this and put him on healthy food, 
He never broke his parole again, and he didn't commit any more violent acts. He was a changed person. And everybody remarked how they just couldn't believe it was the same person. <coughs> Study a prison system in five different states, and they looked at adult felons, and they looked for deficiencies in a lot of different nutrients, but mainly magnesium, zinc, folate, and vitamin B6. What they found in all five states was that violent offenders had the most deficiencies of all the prisoners. The more violent, the more deficiencies. So it's not just hypoglycemia. Oklahoma Children's Center did a similar study and they found there was a 43% reduction in a serious crime when they changed the diet. They got rid of the high fat, high sugar diet and junk food that these childhood offenders were on. When they wanted to objectify it and say, well, is there any objective evidence of change in brain function, they look at EEG function in, in felons. Uh, these are serious criminals. And what they found is that there were about 14 different abnormalities in their EEG. When they switched their diet, it went from 14 to two abnormalities. So the EEG improved considerably, and one child uh, went from six to zero abnormalities with giving a simple vitamin. And they found that even marginal deficiencies in nutrition could cause criminal behavior to surface in these susceptible individuals, which are pretty high numbers. Selenium is one of the things we find that has a lot to do with brain function. There's a lot of new studies on selenium and brain function. Before, we thought selenium mainly had to do with things like antioxidant activity, uh, we thought it was for the health of the liver and the heart. Uh, now we understand that actually it has things to do with the functioning of the brain itself, particularly uh, behavior. We found that deficiencies in selenium are commonly associated with depression and periods of confusion, and that when you elevate the selenium intake, there was a significant improvement in people's mood. And newer studies have shown that it does indeed play a major role in how the brain functions. So deficiency is very detrimental to the brain. Now, all right, let's look at one of the major offenders, and that's sugar consumption. In 1900, Americans consumed about four pounds of sugar a year. That's not very much sugar. Now they consume about 129 pounds a year, a 2,500% increase in sugar consumption. So we've seen um, multiple large studies, well-controlled studies, that the amount of sugar in your diet has direct activity in terms of your criminal behavior, your propensity to violent acts, and to antisocial behavior. And we're consuming more than ever. 57% of this sugar comes from processed foods. It's not putting a spoon of sugar in your coffee. It's hidden in your foods, particularly processed foods. The leading source of all sugar in the, in the American diet is fruit juices and sodas. 43% of all the sugar is coming from those two sources. And if you go anywhere, there's young people, they're drinking sodas, but you think from what people say, it's mostly young people. Because if you look at the ads from Coca-Cola and Pepsi, they're all targeted at the young. And what do mothers do when their babies get old enough to start giving them some table food and juice? They give them apple juice, which is about at one of those little uh, cardboard containers. Uh, it's 35 grams of sugar. Uh, uh, orange juice, all the berry juices are extremely high in sugar. So you start your child out early in life getting used to this high sugar intake. Now since 1974, the consumption of sodas has doubled. So we're drinking more soft drinks than ever before. Teenagers are drinking an equivalent of 54 teaspoons of sugar a day, just from the sodas. The nutritionists say that your limit should be 10 teaspoons a day. So they're consuming about five times more than that. And of course, some are 10 times that. Uh, you have these great big drinks that you get at uh, McDonald's, and uh, they think nothing of drinking them. Uh, that's the thing to do. If you're thirsty, you drink something that has sugar in it. Study from UNC at Chapel Hill 
they looked at adults age 49 to 50 and found that they increased their intake of soft drink consumption 250%. So it's not just the young people. And ironically, when they looked at those over age 60, they had increased it 300%. Well, metabolically, we know when you consume a lot of sugar, what it does is it dramatically increases the free radical generation in your brain. And it produces cross-linking of the proteins in all of your cells that dramatically increases the damaging effect of these free radicals. The bottom line is it makes every cell in your body age uh, much, much faster, particularly brain cells. People who consume a lot of calories, particularly in sugar, their incidence of Alzheimer's disease is about six times higher than everybody else's. So your caloric intake, particularly in sugar, has more to do with Alzheimer's disease than a lot of things that uh, people think are related. It's estimated that 50% of the population in the United States has reactive hypoglycemia. What this means is if you eat something with sugar or drink something with sugar, your blood sugar will fall dramatically because of an over-secretion of insulin. It gets so low, you start getting these symptoms of being very anxious, angry, trembly, week uh, where you feel like you just have to hurry up and eat something with sugar in it uh, are you going to pass out and some people do pass out and have seizures and some people die from reactive hypoglycemia and again it goes back to sugar stimulates insulin release which causes hypoglycemia which stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol epinephrine norepinephrine makes the brain secrete glutamate the excitotoxin and all of this results in hyperactive behavior but it also results in permanent brain damage. Now, numerous studies have shown there's a close correlation between alcohol abuse, hypoglycemia, and criminal behavior. If you look at the most violent felons in prison, most of them are hypoglycemic, most of them are alcohol abusers. And we know that the violent felons, when they drink alcohol, their blood sugar falls tremendously. They're getting a hyperreactive effect from the alcohol. And I remember a young man in my practice one time came in and he had lost all the vision and half of his visual field. He couldn't see anything on one side. And what happened is he was drinking, his blood sugar fell, it fell so low he went into a coma and he had a stroke on one side of his brain and the visual portion of his brain. And that happens. And young people don't know that can happen, but it, it's not that uncommon. You can have seizures and you can die during these spells. An interesting correlation between alcoholism and hypoglycemia, in the study they found 97% of alcoholics were hypoglycemic, uh, compared to 18% for the control. And the reason the alcoholic continues to drink alcohol is because the alcohol is a source of tremendous energy. And so when their blood sugar falls, they drink the alcohol, they feel better, and their blood sugar falls again, they drink more alcohol, and it's just an unending cycle. Now this is what happens when you treat the hypoglycemia. They found that if they treated the hypoglycemia, 71% of alcoholics became sober. Alcoholics Anonymous best rate is only 25%. So correcting one condition corrected another condition. And if you look at the FBI statistics, most of the violent crimes in the United States are connected to alcohol. Most of your auto accidents are connected to alcohol. Most of your road rage are connected to alcohol because it's producing the same effect that the sugar's producing. Now, the most aggressive effects of this is in people who have abnormalities of the temporal lobe of the brain. The temporal lobe is not just for memory, but it's the elaboration center for your emotion particularly things like anger, connects to the amygdala, a nucleus in the brain that has to do with anger. And we find that if people with temporal lobe dysfunction become hypoglycemic, they become enraged. Uh, these are the people who have road rage. These are the people who, in a uh, moment of anger, stomp somebody to death or picks up a knife and stabs somebody to death just out of the blue for th things that are so minor most of us would just shrug it off but they don't because it triggers their temporal lobe their anger centers in their temporal lobe and they lose all control we call it the discontrolled syndrome and working in emergency rooms for many many years i can tell you all the alcoholics i saw come in some of the most violent people 
for the alcoholics. And it would take everybody in the emergency room to hold them down. They had tremendous strength, and they were like enraged animals. And that's why you see these things, a road rage, that when you hear about it, you think, how could someone do that? Well, it's not a conscious act of them doing it. It's the fact that you have lowered their blood sugar or had an effect of uh, one of these nutrients on their brain function that drives them like wild animals. If I put an electrode in your brain and I stimulate that same center, you will attack whoever's closest to you and you'll try to kill them. And you can't stop it. So this is the effect that nutrition can have. They looked at a group of uh, Indians in Peru, found that 55% were hypoglycemic. It is the most violent people on earth, this one tribe. And they found it's because they're hypoglycemic. I'll cover that a little bit more later. Now, sugar's not the only thing that can make you hypoglycemic. Aspartame, NutraSweet, and monosodium glutamate are both powerful stimulators of insulin release. They will both make you powerfully hypoglycemic. And this is one of the paradoxical things about this sweetener, aspartame. Is if you look at the studies, particularly the ones reported to the FDA, one of the big complaints is it causes weight gain. Everybody's drinking it because they think it makes them lose weight. Actually, it makes you gain weight in a lot of people. And that's because it makes you hypoglycemic, and so you tend to eat and snack and nibble. And you gain weight. Monosodium glutamate will do the same thing. Now, the food manufacturers know this. That's why they put so much MSG in food, because it makes you hungry and you, you eat more of their food. And we know that MSG can induce intense rage if you just put minute concentrations in this part of the brain. If you do a little micro-injection, you can make a, a mouse attack a cat. And it can even kill the cat. I mean, it is an intense rage that's almost uncontrollable. Now, when you're hypoglycemic and you add MSG at the same time, you produce a tremendous magnification of this effect. Now this happens in society all the time. If you go and you, you have a, your soda and you're drinking it and you're nibbling on some Doritos which are very high in MSG, that's why they taste so good, and your MSG level, your glutamate level in your blood starts to rise, the glutamate stimulates insulin release, the sugar stimulates insulin release, your blood sugar falls, and in susceptible people, which is a lot of people, you can fall into severe rage. So it's a tremendous effect. And of course, excitotoxicity destroys brain cells. Now we also know that there are several amino acids can make you severely hypoglycemic. For instance, taurine, glutamine, valine, isoleucine, and leucine. All can produce profound hypoglycemia. In fact, leucine hypoglycemia in children will kill babies. This is a recognized uh, reason for sudden death. Uh, and it can kill adults. Now, in a Finnish study, Verkuken, in 1983, studied violent offenders in prison. And what he found is that the impulsively violent offender, that is, the one who just would attack you out of the blue and beat you senseless or stomp you to death, their blood sugar fell suddenly, and it rose very quickly. So in other words, the blood sugar would fall, and it would come back up quickly. And those were the ones with the most violence. And the antisocial offender, that is the guy who's going to steal and shoplift, but not necessarily violent, his blood sugar would fall, but then there was a slow rise coming back up. And we know that it's changes in blood sugar that can produce dramatic alterations in brain function and cause these antisocial behaviors. In fact, there were even cases in which uh, we found people would become uh, uh, kleptomaniacs because of high sugar intake. It was an interesting case of a woman who was uh, going to stores stealing like crazy. She got arrested. They found out she was a reactive hypoglycemic. They corrected it, and she never had any more problem uh, with that again. So you can get some rather bizarre be uh, behaviors from this. Uh, Dr. Ron Prince at the University of Florida, 1980, uh, was the first to study behavioral effects systematically in children to see what it would do to children. And he found that children were eating about 40% of their calories as sugar. And when he looked at the highest uh, sugar consumers, the top 25% of these children, found that they had poor measures on attentiveness. That is, they were very hyperactive. These are the kids that are bouncing off the wall. They would go and put on Ritalin. 
Dr. Jane Goldman, University of Connecticut, 1986. She looked at something interesting. She gave the amount of sugar that's equal to what's found in a Coke and found that mental performance by 30 minutes had significantly declined. It had maximized at an hour and that the people drinking the Coke made twice as many mistakes in a test than those who were not drinking Coke. So sugar consumption also has a lot to do with how well you can think and the harmful effects usually subsided about an hour and a half after they've consumed the, the uh, drink. Now Judith Workman and her husband is a neuroscientist, works mainly with nutrition of the brain at uh, MIT, found there's a strong correlation between sugar intake, behavior, brain, and serotonin function. Well all these drugs, what we call SSRI drugs, uh, they're the drugs that regulate and make your brain serotonin level go up. Well, unfortunately, in some people, they'll make the serotonin level go down, and these people will commit suicide or they'll commit murder. And these are the, when they looked at all these uh, kids killing people at different schools around the country, like Columbine, all of them were taking these SSR medications, every one of them. So you were making child killers by lowering the serotonin inadvertently, thinking you were going to raise it. Well, we know that serotonin levels is correlated with carbohydrate levels. And you can create killer mice like I was talking about just by lowering brain serotonin levels. And again, looking at the Kuala Indians in the Andes of Peru, they found that the very aggressive ones, and these are people committing rapes and murders, uh, is a very violent uh, uh, village. 55% of them were hypoglycemic and almost always the one that was doing the killing and the raping and the murdering and such were the, the ones that were most hypoglycemic. Their main diet was potatoes. Well, potatoes is a very powerful hypoglycemic. And how many of you sit around eating potato chips? <laughs> potato chips are powerfully hypoglycemic. It's like eating sugar. This may be why the Irish are so mean sometimes. <laughs> And when they looked at the docile males that lived in the same village, they had normal blood sugars. Uh, Egger and Carter, this is a famous study in 1985, looked at 76 hyperactive children and placed them on the low carbohydrate diet, which also eliminated many of the food diets. And when they did, they found that 82% of the ch uh, children improved on this new diet and 28% actually returned completely to normal. These were children that were very hard to control. The highest reaction in terms of the dyes was yellow dye number five, which is tartrazine, and sodium benzoate, which are very common food additives. The most commonly reactive foods were soybeans, and we're in a soy craze in this country. They got to have soy milk, soy this, soy that, and they think it prevents all these diseases, and it doesn't. Cow's milk, 64%, and chocolate, 59%. So the most reactive food was the soybean, which in this country, we're feeding the baby soybean, we're feeding the mother's soybean, everybody is consuming soy products. This was an interesting study. They looked at college males. And before they uh, enrolled them in the study, they checked to make sure they didn't have any pre-existing psychiatric history, no drug use, and no medical conditions that might affect the outcome of the study. And what they did is they gave them a questionnaire and you could answer it in certain ways that would be aggressive or other ways it would be more passive. And they found almost without exception uh, there was a strong relationship between aggressive type answers and their existence of hypoglycemia. And as we said, uh, serotonin regulates the brain's ability to resist aggressive acts it's a more calming neurotransmitter, and it's the transmitter most connected with depression and suicide. When it's low, you have high suicide rates. When it's low, you have high depression. When it's low, you have high aggression. Corn is very low in the precursor amino acid that is turned into serotonin in your brain. It's called tryptophan. It's very low in corn flakes, corn starch, corn flour, all these corn products. And so if you're eating a high diet in corn products, 
your ability of your brain to make this serotonin is significantly reduced, you're more likely to suffer from depression, suicidal tendencies. Tyrosine is the precursor amino acid for neurotransmitter epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine in the brain. Dopamine has to do with motivation, epinephrine, norepinephrine has to do with attention, so that you can pay attention and, and concentrate on things. We find that low levels of tyrosine associated with depression and sensitivity to stress. And when you increase tyrosine consumption, it reduces stress. Now, vitamins can have a lot to do with these, these factors as well. For instance, niacin has been known to have a lot to do with mental illness. If you look at uh, the function of niacin, it's uh, one of the energy molecules in the body, niacinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD. And in pellagra, you develop characteristically psychiatric symptoms. The four Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. That's the characteristics of four Ds of pellagra. Subclinical deficiencies are commonly associated with psychiatric symptoms. Niacin, there's a niacin responsive form of schizophrenia. If you increase their niacin intake, their schizophrenia goes away. Various nutrients are associated with behavior, vitamin C, D, E, K, A, B, uh, the carotenoids, all of these associated with brain function, uh, have behavioral manifestations if they're deficient. Uh, B1 deficiency, thiamine associated with beriberi. You have insomnia, memory uh, failure, depression, chronic fatigue, personality change is a characteristic of beriberi. And again, we see subclinical deficiencies in uh, the United States. If you're consuming a lot of carbohydrates, it depletes your vitamin B1. So that's how you end up with a thiamine deficiency in the United States. And it's closely connected to magnesium deficiencies. Now, a national survey of uh, adolescents in this country found that 60% were deficient in iron, 57% in vitamin A, 43% in C, 39% in vitamin B1, 30% in protein, and 16% in riboflavin. So being an advanced industrial nation, we sure have a lot of deficiencies and critical nutrients that operate the brain, that controls your behavior. So these are not uncommon problems. Now in this study, probably one of the largest ever done, they looked at 1.1 million New York public school children to see the effect of giving just a single multivitamin, not even a very well formulated multivitamin, but a single multiple vitamin and the effect on the CAT scores. And this is what they found. The black bars here are on a, the regular diet that most of these children eat. Year by year, the uh, cat scores hardly change. And this bar, what they did is they took these children, and some of them they uh, took off of sugar and just a few of the dyes that were involved in the foods. They had a dramatic increase in the CAT score. Then the next year, what they did is they removed some more of the food dyes they had an even greater increase in the CAT scores. The next year, they didn't change anything, they just kept them on this diet, and it held steady. And then in this one, they took out some more food additives, and they found it went up even higher. So we see there's a profound influence on your ability to function intellectually just by changing diet. And most of what you do it's detrimental to your ability to learn and remember and think and cognitively function. And a lot of these things we're saying are marginal deficiencies. They're not severely deficient. They're just marginally deficient. Tucker uh, is one of the more famous uh, studies done, which was done in 1990. He found a deficiency in thiamine and riboflavin not only impaired neuropsychological function, but could produce altered EEG patterns as well. Just two vitamins. He looked at 260 adults over 60 years of age and found an association between the status of vitamin C, riboflavin, B12, folic acid, and concept learning, which is one of the more sensitive measures of brain function. So the brain is very sensitive to these deficiencies. Carotene showed a stronger correlation than did vitamin A. And you know, carotene is converted into the body to vitamin A but carotene itself has different functions than vitamin A. 
Now this is something that a lot of people don't think about and physicians know almost nothing about, and that's, that's food allergies affecting the brain. We call them brain allergies. And a lot more people are allergic to foods than know it. Because you generally think, well, if I'm allergic to a food, it's going to give me stomach cramps or a swell up or, or itch. But most food allergies have subtle symptoms. Some have purely neurological symptoms. Now, what happens is when you're eating these uh, foods that you're allergic to, they enter your bloodstream as whole food components, which you're not supposed to do. And that's because there's little holes in your GI tract. When these food components get into your blood, your immune system recognizes it and you get an immune reaction. And that intense immune reaction also goes on in the brain. So that the brain's immune system is also activated. It releases toxic components, including glutamate, and that's what causes the neurological dysfunction. And you can get all kinds of symptoms from food-triggered immune reactions. Lethargy, stupor, disorientation, paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, agitation, rage, panic attacks, criminal behavior, and even seizures. And one of the interesting connections with food allergies is schizophrenia. I met a researcher from Sweden, and he was doing some primary research in this, which was very interesting. And they found that schizophrenics, 88% were allergic to wheat, 60% to milk, 50% to corn, 100% of them are allergic to either gliadin or gluten, which is added to breads and pastries and stuff. It's in almost all the breads. It's, it's, it's part of the wheat product. Uh, all of them are allergic to gluten and gliadin. So what he did is in this big psychiatric hospital, he took the, uh, one group of schizophrenics and he put them on a diet completely free of gliadin and gluten. Almost all of them returned completely to normal. And as long as they avoided gliadin and gluten, they were normal. When they got back on it, even a small amount of it, they were fully schizophrenic again and had to be hospitalized. Case after case after case. So that shows that this can have a terrible effect on brain function and could end up in a mental institute. Now, ironically, food allergies often make you crave the very food you're allergic to. So you see people are allergic to a food and that's what they want to eat. They'll eat it and eat it and eat it and of course every time they do they get sick. And I, I don't know how many people we've had that complained of, of unable to think and cloudy thinking 